You've probably heard this before. The gradient is like a hiker finding the fastest way down a mountain, or like a compass pointing to the steepest path. And honestly, those are lovely images. But if we only hold on to the metaphor, we might miss what the gradient really is. It's not just a picture in your head. It's a vector with a very specific meaning. And that meaning is what we'll try to uncover here. Here, we're watching gradient descent in 3D with Manum, following the path as it descends. And we'll dig down to the essence so we can understand gradients both intuitively and mathematically. At its core, a gradient is all about change. Let's warm up with the friendliest function we know. f of x equals ax plus b. Here, a is the slope, b is the intercept. If you differentiate, you get a. So, is a a gradient? Yep. When you have just one variable, the gradient is simply the slope. There's no need to think about multidimensional directions because there's only one axis you can move along. In this case, the gradient is just a single number that says, how steep is this line? Technically, the sign of that number also tells you the direction. Positive means uphill to the right, negative means uphill to the left. That's the baby version of a gradient. Like, comment, subscribe, and turn on notifications. But in the real world, especially in machine learning, functions usually depend on many variables. So let's bump it up. f of x1 comma x2. Now things get spicy. With two variables, you can visualize the function in 3D. It becomes a surface. Here's an analogy. Think of house prices. x1, the size of the house. x2, the school district rating. f of x1, x2 is the price. So our surface is basically bigger house plus better schools equals more expensive house. Now, just like before, we want to know, how does this function change? With two variables, there are two main perspectives, partial derivatives and the total differential. Partial derivative, hold one variable constant and wiggle the other. If you differentiate with respect to x1, you get a. If you differentiate with respect to x2, you get b. So partials tell you, how much does price change if I change just the house size or if I only change the school rating? The total differential is more global. What if both change a little bit at the same time? Then df equals a dx1 plus b dx2. Since our function here is linear, this formula is exact. So where does the gradient show up? Right here. It's the vector that collects those partials. Gradient f equals a comma b. That's the gradient. Another way to think about it is from vector calculus. Remember, f of x1, x2 is just a single number, a scalar, but you can write it as a dot product, a, b, c, dot, x1, x2, 1. Drop the dummy 1, and it's essentially a, b, dot, x1, x2. Now here's the neat part. If you differentiate with respect to the input vector, the coefficients a, b pop out. That's the gradient. So you can say the gradient is the vector of partial derivatives, or it's the result of differentiating a scalar function with respect to its input vector. Same thing. Now the total differential again, df equals gradient f dot dx1 dx2. This tells us if you move in the same direction as the gradient, the dot product is maximized. The function increases fastest. If you move perpendicular to the gradient, the dot product is zero. The function doesn't change at all. And that's why the gradient is always perpendicular to contour lines. Sound abstract? Hang tight, the visuals are coming. Okay, let's start with the direction of the gradient. Remember, the gradient means taking the derivative of f with respect to the vector x. In other words, it's just the vector you get by writing down all the partial derivatives one by one. Here, since a equals 1 and b equals 2, 
the gradient comes out to 1, 2. On the left, we'll look at it in 3D, and on the right, in 2D. I've marked the X1 component 1 in blue, and the X2 component 2 also in blue. And the gradient vector 1, 2 itself is shown here in yellow. Let's check it out. This yellow vector points in the direction where the function increases the fastest. That's exactly this red line here. And if we drop it down to the x1, x2 plane, it lines up perfectly with the yellow vector. Now what about the size of the gradient? Does it just mean how much the whole surface is tilted compared to the x1, x2 plane? Not quite. It doesn't just mean steepness in general. It actually tells us how fast the function value goes up if we move in the gradient direction. So the gradient's magnitude is really the slope in the steepest direction. For example, this purple line here isn't the gradient. It's just one possible slope of the surface. In single variable functions, the absolute value of the derivative gave us the steepness of the curve, right? Just one line to worry about. But in multivariable functions, you can draw lots of different lines on the surface, and each one has a different slope. Among all those, the steepest one is the gradient direction. And the size of the gradient vector is the slope in that direction, the maximum rate of change. In other words, the gradient's magnitude tells us if we move one unit in the gradient direction, the function increases by exactly that much. In this example, the gradient's magnitude is the square root of 5. So that means if we move just one unit in the yellow gradient direction, the function value goes up by the square root of 5. It's not that the whole plane is tilted by the square root of 5. It's that in this special direction, f increases at the square root of 5 per unit step. Now let's see why the gradient is always perpendicular to contour lines. I'll draw four contour lines on this plane. Remember, a contour line connects all the points where f has the same value. So each color here means the same function value. Now let's project these lines onto the x1, x2 plane. Take a look. Let's view them from above. Do you notice? the gradient vector looks perpendicular to the contour lines. Why is that? Well, imagine moving along one of these contour lines. Does the function value change? Nope, it stays the same. Because, by definition, a contour line connects points with the same value of f. So the change in f, written as df, must be zero. Here's the formula for the total differential. It says the gradient vector dotted with the change vector dx1, dx2 equals df. But since we're moving along the contour line, df equals zero. So the dot product between the gradient and dx1, dx2 must be zero. Why is that? Well, if the dot product of two non-zero vectors the gradient vector and the dx1, dx2 vector is zero. The only possibility is that they're perpendicular. Let's check the geometric definition. When two vectors are non-zero, their dot product is like this. For this to be zero, cos theta must be zero, which means theta equals 90 degrees. So in the end, the gradient has to be perpendicular to the contour lines. Now, let's look at the gradient from the viewpoint of a directional derivative. This time, instead of moving only along a contour line, imagine moving in any direction in the plane. Naturally, the change in f depends on which direction you choose. So the question is, how can we measure the rate of change of f in a given direction? Well, that's exactly why people came up with the formula for the directional derivative. The directional derivative tells us how fast the function changes at a given point when we move in some direction vector v, like this purple arrow here. And here is the neat part. It's computed by taking the dot product of the gradient vector 
with that direction vector v. Remember, v has to be a unit vector, so its length is 1. Now among all possible directions, so in which direction does the directional derivative reach its maximum? In other words, which direction makes f increase the fastest? Of course, the gradient itself. That's what the gradient has been telling us all along, the steepest direction. And when the two vectors point in the same direction, the angle between them is zero. So cos theta equals one. Plugging this into the dot product formula gives us the product of their magnitudes. But since V is a unit vector, its magnitude is one. So in this special case, the directional derivative just equals the magnitude of the gradient itself.